Welcome back to this special edition of Cattlemen to Cattlemen. As we talk with a group of experts about the topic of beef industry sustainability. You know, we were just talking before break about perceptions people have of our industry and our product. And Wayne, uh, I'm curious again from downstream, what are the perceptions of beef industry sustainability from folks outside our industry? I think that the perceptions most people have um, are drawn upon from just um, ignorance of what happens. We've got a disconnection between uh, what we do and what is done in, in not just sustainability, probably all areas of, of beef production and what actually happens. Um, people have this perception that uh, farms are controlled by big corporations and that it's all just a big business. It's some kind of machine out there that's generating these food products that they get on, on their table every day. Uh, they, they don't have an appreciation for these are individual men and women that get up every morning and do a job to bring this product to, to the table. Um, so to me, the biggest perception uh, that, that we deal with is this, um, this idea that there's, there's a, a corporate machine out there manufacturing product and that they don't care about anything except for a profit. Gotcha. And even though nothing could be farther from the f truth, I think that's where most people's heads immediately go when they talk about um, in our livestock industry in general. Dr. Place, you've been interviewed a number of times. You've been on TV shows and talk shows. I mean, what are some of the misperceptions you've heard? Yeah, so I think to Wayne's point, actually a lot of it comes back to just the basics of how cattle are raised mm -hmm. and the idea that cattle are housed in these extreme conditions. So, okay. you know, for example, we've We've had tours with folks that are not just consumers, but they are uh, buyers for sure. universities, for hospitals, uh, taking them out to a university feed yard and seeing the conditions of, you know, cattle are in a pen and they're free to roam around and consume feed when they want. And uh, a comment was made, well, I expected that they were all going to be in cages. Wow. Right. So um, some of those very basic things are where a lot of this sustainability misperception can fester. Sure. And that's why I think people can latch on to ideas like that cattle are producing more greenhouse gas emissions than cars, right? Because they're already so uh, divorced from reality in terms of how things are being produced, right. if that makes sense. Um, so I think what we see over and over again, even though sustainability is bigger than the environment, a lot of these misperceptions come down to environmental impact at the end of the day, and a lot of it about climate change, really. What have you heard over time, Colin? You know, it's interesting when you look at the misperceptions and how they have found their way into so many issues that are having an impact on our industry right now. Dr. Place just said this is bigger than just the environment mm -hmm. and we're seeing that in things such as the dietary guidelines and the right. discussion on the formulation of the 2020 dietary guidelines. We have seen this in introduction of the Green New Deal on Capitol Hill and the fact that it really received a lot of support from constituents and individuals who just don't know the facts exactly. of what's going on and it has really played a big hand in our continued battle against fake meat. Right. Because one of the things that we see both from the consumer that is buying this product and also the companies that are manufacturing this product is they use these misperceptions to their advantage to try to market their product over our product. Well, this creation of a feeling of guilt really bothers me. You know, you got to feel guilty about eating beef because what it's doing to the environment. And I'm curious, what are we doing to correct that misperception and to lift that guilty feeling that's saying you can have what you love to eat, Bob, a great piece of beef, and feel comfortable that you're not contributing to global warming? Yes, so I think a lot of it, a lot of the conversation has shifted over time as we've seen more engagement from folks in the beef industry, right? So I think that's a positive is whether it's through roundtables, through the efforts of NCBA, through the beef checkoff, right? These things do change when you actually engage with the conversation. Um, so in terms of, it, of addressing that, I think that those entities are part of that. And honestly, even just producers engaging, right? It, it can be as simple as engaging at the local level, because sure. I think probably a lot of viewers have that, that experience where even in rural communities, right, you, you hear some of these things about uh, misperceptions or documentaries being shown in schools that have a lot of misinformation about animal agriculture in there, right? So um, I think that's the key thing that's been brought up earlier is that first and foremost, we got to be there and it does make a difference 
difference when you're there in terms of having that conversation and bringing the facts to the table and being being respectful about it, right? Because to your point about guilt, um, we got to think about the psychology of this, right? Like people are um, making these decisions because they feel like they want to do something good. And we have to give people the alternative, which is you did do something good when you bought beef, right? You right. supported wildlife habitat. You did good by supporting rural communities. Um, you, you did good by climate change, right? I mean, that, that's what we have to connect those dots for people, that it's not just we're less bad, it's that we are a positive contributor to the world. That's great to hear, because I know in our rural community, my kids were asked to read an article in health class, junior high health class, that was based on, could this be your future dinner? And it was a plate of uh, insects, talking about the value of insect protein and, and what they're doing for climate when they uh, eat that or choose something like that rather than beef. And this is in rural America, Kersey, Colorado. So it's all over. Speaking of which, let's talk about uh, the elephant in the room, so to speak. You mentioned it before, Bob, and that's uh, greenhouse gas. The fact of the matter is, we do have ruminant animals, and right. they do produce greenhouse gas. Talk to us about what we need to know relative to that. Well, I think it's important, and we're starting to have that conversa conversation uh, about cattle producers are, are actually uh, not, not part of the problem, but part of the solution. Okay. And, uh, you know, cattle harvest a lot of plant materials that are they're inedible by humans and convert it into this wonderful nutrient-dense uh, product, you know, that uh, has beef and that's, that's healthy and good for you. And in that process, you know, there's, uh, there's some conversions going on that uh, the scientists like Dr. Place could speak to better than me, but there's some conversions going on that they're actually taking, you know, carbon out of the atmosphere and putting it into a carbon sink. There's things like regenerative grazing that there's a lot of research going on right now about okay. and uh, carbon sequestration. And, uh, and, and that's part of why at the round tables, we, uh, we like to incorporate a lot of the researchers, a lot of the universities yes. And, uh, and the NGOs also have, have deep interest in this and, and have been very, very helpful, a lot of them have. And so it's, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a basic tenet that, uh, you know, cattle producers are, uh, we're part of the solution mm -hmm. and we, we want our consumers to, to know that. And I think the more they get that information, the better they feel about their consuming that product. So why should beef producers engage in conversations, social media, one-on-one -on -one and otherwise, about sustainability? Wayne, what would you say? So uh, we look at things from uh, the po point of view that the consumers are right. Yep. Whether, whether they're exactly right or, or not, they're still right. And we feel like um, we, we need to go with a one-two punch. Yep. One, show them that we care. Show them that these topics are also mean something to us and that they are important, but two, come behind it with the facts. Come, come back with the science and the data to support the, the facts that, that we are a part of the solution. What are a couple of key talking points that we as producers should should have on the tip of our tongue, Sarah? Yeah, so despite what I just said about the, the greenhouse gas emissions, even when we look at the, the old way of accounting for methane, okay. right? Direct emissions from cattle and their manure, two percent of US greenhouse gas emissions according to the EPA. Yeah. And that's that's one of those according things. According the EPA, not yes, according to no, NCBA, exactly. according the EPA. Yes, yes, and that's that's what's really key. So this this whole uh, idea that we're gonna eat our way out of climate change, that you know, depriving yourself of nutritious and delicious beef is gonna make a difference is, is really kind of fantasy, right? So um, I think that's one of those key things to remember. And then was brought up, you know, the, the power of the ruminant is really key. I think we need to talk about what we bring to the table as beef mm -hmm. and talk about that upcycling story, right? Of what cattle do is convert things of little or no value to higher value products, right? We know that if we look at the feed conversion of on a protein basis, cattle generate two and a half times more high quality protein for the world, for our food supply than exists without them, right? And I think that's important for people to, to communicate that story too. That's, that's great news. And you know, Kevin, there's a lot of people out there that believe that if we remove cattle from the land, that we can use that land to grow other things. Right. And I'm here to tell you, we're not gonna grow broccoli in central Nevada. It's just not gonna happen, but we can grow forage. And as Dr. Place just said, we have an animal that can convert that forage, which is of no use to us as humans, and turn it into high quality protein. So that is why we have such a, a great story to tell. And back to Wayne's point, we have to tell that story because if there's a void out there, there's plenty of people that are willing to fill that void. 
Beyond Burger, Impossible Burger. They would love to fill that void for us. So if we're not tooting our own horn, then these facts are never going to get out. And we need to make sure that we continue to get that out. Social media, Cattlemen to Cattlemen, all our opportunities to share it, not only with producers, but especially with consumers. We are the original plant-based protein. Would you agree? <laughs> yes. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> Still to come on Cattlemen to Cattlemen, we'll dig deeper into the issue of sustainability with our panel of experts. Stay with us.